那现在我们就开始那个之前我们提到的这一个讨论会的现在下一个环节，呃，这个环节呢是一个互动的环节，就是我们会有几位专家在台上，然后呢由 c a s s i d y 作为一个主持人，我们有一些主题会希望可以大家有一个积极的一个互动，好吗？好，现在开始，有请 c a s s i d y 嗨 ，Thanks for staying, and、uh, thanks so much too for for、uh, all your active input into this discussion and. I hope that you can continue just a little bit longer, and because、um, we're interested in in making this a discussion among us all. So I、uh, put together a few slides of some of the general interest、uh, trends and questions that we thought would be interesting. But、uh, don't hesitate to ask anything、uh, that you think is important yourselves, and I encourage you to ask questions in Chinese. We the translators are here, so we'll do our best with it. And、um, so we can start. Some of the、uh, areas that we thought might be interesting for、uh, discussion would be、um, the various operating、uh, systems. This came up earlier, and the questions of licensed versus open versus closed. There's、uh, a lot of variation now, and all the nothing is very clear cut. So Android is more or less open, except that. There's a lot of fragmentation, and、um, but iOS and Apple, which is famously closed, is open to standards. And then, of course, there's Microsoft and、uh, Windows 8, which we think is going to、uh, be tremendously important. And、uh, right as of right now, they're not very open at all. So the way I、uh, found this on the web, which I thought was an interesting trend on the、uh, operating systems, it's nothing that we haven't seen already.、Uh, Android trending way up. Apple pretty sta、uh, stable, and Microsoft hasn't really gotten its start, and、uh, it's taken them quite a while. So、uh, when worlds collide, so to、uh, to carry on to that theme specifically, we're talking about DirectX、uh, versus Kronos APIs, and I hope that we could have a discussion among these people that are involved in all these different areas of、um, of the API. Uh, world and the、uh, mobile world, where they see opportunities and, and possibilities of working together or working around. Another area of interest is something that's been changing quite a bit. Who's in charge, really? Who defines the specs?、Uh, is it the、uh, operating system, the operators, hardware manufacturers? We're seeing this change really rapidly. For a long time, when we were having these discussions, what we were seeing. Was that the operators were in charge, the carriers were in charge, and、uh, I think that that is giving way as a result of the success of app stores. And one of the、uh, points that Neil brought up earlier today was that、um, in the future we're going to see also some of this give way as the web browsers become the the central sort of carrier for the application. So what happens to the、uh, operators in the future, and what about the、um, various Um, uh, access to wireless,、uh, and does what happens when it's so much easier and more universal to get online? Does the world become smaller, or do we see continued fragmentation? I mean, after all, there are a lot of people that like fragmentation. So、um, another thing that happens is as we have standards and as、um, things work better. Then there's it becomes more difficult to differentiate, and it becomes more difficult to make money. So,、um, where are the opportunities? And I, and there's a flip side to this because the hardware makers、uh, want to make money, and we can blame them. On the other hand,、um, as as this becomes more and more ubiquitous, the hardware, the devices become invisible. They're they're just sort of a carrier for the applications, which is a really interesting thought as well. And that happens. It, it won't happen tomorrow, but it's where the world heads. And then and then that brings us to the Internet of Things, something we didn't talk about、uh, a whole lot in detail, but、uh, it, it's such a fascinating path for the future. What happens when everything has a digital pulse? So,、uh, and one of the things I thought about was what what more work could we do uh, for um, uh, APIs for all these things to play together and play nicely. So let's let's get started here.
one other thing. Our panelists were all introduced to you uh, first thing in the morning. <clears throat> By now, you may have forgotten who everybody is. So I'll ask that the first time any of you um, type up to speak, please say who you are and who you're working for uh, so, so we can all remember. <laughs> so um, let's start with this question of the operating systems. And, um, and, and being sort of optimistic, I said, where are the opportunities? But uh, let's also talk about where are the um, challenges, uh, because there's there's cracks here between all the um, the different players. So I'm Tom Olson from ARM and uh, chairman of the EPS Working Group, and I, do, I don't have an answer to this question, but I would like to observe. Uh, we've seen this movie before. Uh, there is this tension between what we call a walled garden where I build my little garden and I keep everyone out and I control everything that happens. Uh, ten years ago, everyone in Carlos remembers all of the cell phone operating companies each had their own walled garden. And they would allow a small number of Java apps and they would collect three quarters of the money from the developer and give one quarter to the developer. So, no great surprise, nobody wanted to write software for them because each one was different and you could not make money. As I said in my talk, uh, the economic system never works unless everyone in the chain, the hardware producer, the OS vendor, the application producer, uh, all have to make money. Um, so I think we will continue to see, I think there is room for both kinds of platforms to some extent. I do think we are seeing now Apple, Microsoft, trying to see how much control they can have without killing, mm -hmm. uh, we say, the goose that lays the golden egg. I don't know if you uh, know this term, but uh, too much control will clearly kill the ecosystem, and platforms that are too controlled will fail. Platforms that don't have enough control will also fail. And Google is trying to see if they can go, how far can they go that way? Mm -hmm. I was going to bring that up because right. there is the flip side too of, of um, sort of too much goodness, too mm -hmm. much openness, and and and, it, and we've certainly mm -hmm. seen that with you too. But. Yes, and I have heard game developers tell me we cannot target Android; it's too chaotic. There's too little commonality. I've also heard people say I will not write for iPhone; it's too restrictive. Um, and so I think both opinions are legitimate, and probably at the same time we will find some developers who prefer one model and some developers who prefer another. Hi, I'm uh, Terry Matsumoto from Takumi Corporation. Takumi is a very small Japanese uh, uh, graphics, hardware graphics accelerator IP providers. One of them. Uh, I would like to observe uh, these, um, I mean, these topics from the OS provider point of view. Uh, we have Android, we have iOS, we have Windows, and they have common target or goals to achieve, which is to make as much money out of, out of uh, successful device selling or application selling. And in that sense, iOS is really close. Apple doesn't have to care to whom they are going to sell their OS or license their OS. And they don't have to even care about the pricing of the OS license, which means they don't have any competitors. They do have competitors for handsets, but they don't have competitors for OS to get into iPhone. And for Windows, uh, well, let me talk first about uh, before Windows, uh, let me refer to uh, Google's Android. Because Android is license free, everybody wants to use Android because they, the hardware device manufacturers don't have to pay any license fee for OS, which naturally generates more penetration, no, more participation in the game, which means the hard Android hardware will face a serious and intensive price competition. Windows is in between. Windows have only two or three 
licensees, Nokia, uh, represented by Nokia and Qualcomm, I think. HTC. Anyway, uh, Windows, I mean, Microsoft would like to make money out of licensing OS as well as selling applications. However, because license fee is not free, it's really tough for them to gather more licensees. So I think Microsoft may sooner or later will end up having to choose either model, license fee or close, totally close, which means Microsoft might acquire Nokia or a few more handset OEMs. Or Google comes to share the same license model as Microsoft in the, in the future. Microsoft, I mean, Google hasn't said that it's totally free out of license uh, or royalty forever. They have to make money out of letting other devices use, use uh, Android. So we will see what's going to happen in a few, a few years, yeah. uh, what real intention of Google was. Um, <clears throat> Eric Narecki, I'm independent. I'm a consultant which specializes in standardization. <clears throat> to build on what Terry was saying, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you look at where OS manufacturers make their income, uh, it's an interesting uh, thing to look at. Is you have to include the application developer market. Applications today are driving the sale of smartphones and operating systems. The operating systems themselves have different uh, income models. Apple, for instance, they not only make you know, money from iOS, or they make money indirectly off of iOS, they sell the hardware for it, and they also have the app store where they get a take of the money. Uh, for Windows, Windows is licensing it so that um, you pay a license fee to Windows to put Windows on the device. And Google, all right, they make a little bit of money off of various application stores. But where their market is, and actually is the information that's collected, uh, where they sell information about the devices. Uh, usage information. And I think that's uh, also three different uh, models that are going to have the operating system manufacturers target different application markets. So that Apple, they really do want a common, very strict system for application developers. They want to make sure that they have control of applications of the operating system and the hardware. Windows, or Microsoft, is interested in having control of the pricing of the operating system. They want, they just want revenue from X number of sales. Whereas Google is more interested in making sure that people use their devices. They want to have as many different kinds of applications on their system so that they can find out how users really want to use their devices. What kind of things do people want? so that the, they can actually market that information further on. And, and it's, it's, it makes it very difficult to really take a look and bring it just to open, closed, or halfway in between. Um, the pricing model and the whole system there of how you market the devices is going to determine whether you want an open or a closed system. Yeah, I agree. The pricing models are very non-trivial. They're much more complex this time around than they were in PC space. You know, the, the fact that Google actually is going to make their money out of information advertising, nothing to do with OS revenue uh, per se, I think uh, complicates things in interesting ways. And the fact that actually, you know, Android actually isn't free. By the time an OEM has integrated an Android OS on their hardware, it's very much not free. They get no support, typically, from Google. There's a big cost in the engineering, so it's not free. And actually, there's royalties, some OEMs are paying royalties to Microsoft. Currently, Microsoft probably is making more money out of Android than it is out of Windows Mobile. 
because it gets you know, royalties from OEMs like uh, HTC and others. Um, so that, it comes down to, I think, in the end, in the end, it comes down to uh, ecosystem momentum, the number of apps, the number of active developers, the amount of energy that's going into your ecosystem versus the other guys. I think the Android is, there, there is a movie being played here, it's the PC versus Mac, where the PC was open, uh, Apple is awesome, and they're gathering most of the margin, but in terms of the number of installed devices, the fact that Android is more open, they're going to get a thousand companies investing and innovating on their platform. But in the end, it doesn't matter how awesome Apple is, they're just one company. And they're going to be out innovated in, in many ways, not always, but in some ways they're going to be out innovated. And the, the Mac is closed in terms of, uh, uh, well, semi closed in terms of APIs. Um, but they can, Apple can get away with that right now because they have such good brand and so a decent volume. I think Microsoft's in the tricky position. They're kind of going even more close than Microsoft. And they're actually cutting out some of the APIs that were all of the mobile apps are actually written to. And they don't have the market share to justify that hubris. And I think that that's the untenable position that's going to have to change um, uh, before long. You know what, Neil, and hang on to that, um, hang on to the mic, because I think that bleeds us right out into the uh, sort of Worlds colliding and uh, the where do we find the opportunities for, uh, for uh, dealing with this system, yes, problem? That's right. And I think with Windows 8 on on ARM, which is kind of where the mobile and Windows worlds collide, mm -hmm. Microsoft does have a secret weapon. It's Office. You know, running true Office on mobile devices is what many people actually want to do. And you, they can't do it on Android. They can't even do it on iOS. Um, but I think that's a sweet thing for tablets and kind of the ultrabook format tablets that you know, we have at the back there. If I had that, I would throw my laptop away tomorrow. Um, but without true office, I can't do that. But I'm not sure if that, that, that secret weapon is going to come down into the mobile phone space. I'm not sure that many people really care about editing their, their Excel spreadsheet on a you know, four point to the screen. Or maybe, maybe more on problem. One of the things I was thinking is, is, um, is there, do you guys see a possibility of uh, Microsoft hitting, getting tired enough of hitting that wall that, um, that they do open up? Or, um, or is that a never? Because we've also seen them being very resistant for a very long time. I, I hope they do. Because um, I think Kronos is going to try to help persuade them. I'm not sure how much they will listen. But, but they should listen. If they don't listen to us, they should listen to the developers. Because they're really just making the developers' lives more difficult by insisting on a completely different API set. And in the mobile space, again, I'm not sure they have the market share to really you know, boost uh, a, a thriving mobile Windows-based ecosystem if they can't um, easily port over lots of the applications that are built using APIs like WebGL and OpenGL. So I hope they do. I think we'll be in their interest. I agree. Um, I think the reason it's in their interest is that for the the three platforms, Android, iOS, and let's say Windows 8 is a platform, even though it's not really shipping yet, um, it is a war for the developers. The value comes from the population of people who write apps and provide services uh, with a level of energy Neil spoke about that no platform manufacturer can compete with. Uh, so, I mean, right now it is true, Android is trending up. Uh, it's far outselling iOS, but it concerns me still when I hear from game developers, I cannot make money selling on Android, even though there are five times as many Android platforms as iOS platforms. But I can sell my, platform, my game on Apple, because the cost of developing for it is less. I think the lesson for people who like open systems, who like the Android business model, which I, I agree is a healthy model, is we have to deal with the fragmentation problems. We have to make it possible for software developers to uh, develop at reasonable cost. I, I agree. I think the fragmentation is an issue. I think it's something that if we work at, we can reduce the fragmentation, and Google needs to really work at that really hard. There, there, there are other issues, though, just as potent if Google don't fix them soon, like DRM. 
you know, they just when you go down to say, well, I sold one copy, then it does copy. You know, because the DRM gets broken so easily on the App Store uh, that you know, it's a real issue for the people getting there. And Google has to get around to get on that stuff. I think there's another issue too for application developers, and that's the availability of the, the feature set. Whereas both Microsoft and iOS tend to have a more complete base feature set. When you uh, take the Microsoft operating system, uh, take, uh, for a PC for instance, it does have the full functionality in it. Um, iOS, of course, uh, comes on specific devices where the full functionality of the device is available. With Android, there's the problem, uh, the underlying problem of fragmentation is that Google doesn't support all the features in a smartphone from, uh, from the base operating system. Individual handset manufacturers have to add on to the operating system to give the functionality that they have in their hardware. And that in itself will cause the fragmentation in that it is not a standard set of features available in Android that application developers are looking for. So what are some examples? Uh, some examples of that are, um, as I was talking about earlier, is the audio system. The base audio system in Android is, um, is not all there. Um, while they do support a subset of open SLEs, they don't. It doesn't support enough for game developers. So there are other vendors out there who supply audio systems that replace the, the Google audio system to add the 3D functionality, to add the full music functionality so that you can get rich audio out of a device. But it's not there from the get-go. Can I ask a question of Tom? Sure. This would be the interest of being stimulating. So, because you have DirectX 11 up there. Mm -hmm. DirectX 11 will be part of Windows 8, and it will be on mobile, it will be on ARM. Do you think that the, ARM, the competitor to OpenGL being available at the DX11 level quickly will affect the roadmap for OpenGL yet? I think the answer is clearly yes. It is a, uh, uh, DirectX 11, as an engineer, I think is a very good API. It provides a lot of functionality very efficiently. Uh, it is a challenge to uh, the mobile API for open cross-platform devices, uh, which we will have to do, and I think we will. So I think this kind of um, leads in a little bit too, because um, the developers are, um, if they're not in charge, they're powerful. And um, uh, one of the things that, uh, while they, they're like, the Apple Store is working well on some levels, uh, Apple's uh, sort of capriciousness, or you know, the, uh, developers have complained about uh, it takes too long to get approved, or and they don't know if all of a sudden that approval will be pulled, or various issues like that. They're chafing about that. Um, and then the, um, and then what Neil brought up was the idea is as the browser becomes perhaps the central carrier of, of the technology that changes the picture as well, that might be bad. <laughs> it might be a, an even worse free for all. So um, let me know what you guys think about that. I, I think it is obvious that uh, applications and will have um, a significant power to define the specifications requirements because to handset um, no, to um, companies like Apple or Windows or Google, uh, the biggest monetization model is uh, selling applications. And the monthly payment for uh, regular use of the phone will not change or grow or even could go down uh, unless you um, uh, keep the number of uh, subscribers go up. So, um, the application business is the most powerful and will, which will bring the most sustainable uh, source of uh, monetization. So application providers uh, will naturally have the biggest power on what kind of specifications the publisher should have. That's my, that's my observation. 
I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I, I agree that they are one of the most powerful influencers, but they have actual no control when it comes to defining what goes into the OS. And I think that's going to be one of the reasons, one of the interesting things to watch, which of the OS vendors are most responsive, and they should be responsive, but they're not necessarily You're right. yeah. responsive. And you know, the, it's going to be the application developers that manage to influence the OS guys and the OS guys that listen. I think it's going to be most responsive. Because you're absolutely right in that content is king. These, these mobile devices are nothing without content. And I've seen OS vendors that shall not be named making horrible decisions in terms of <laughs> APIs. And you know, I can make a plug for the standardization process again. It's easy to say, oh, it's, it's like John was saying in his presentation. It's easy to come up with a spec that's like, off the top of your head. It takes longer to build a consensus or a standard, but a standard is often the fastest way to a real ecosystem where lots of chip vendors are supporting it. It's been well rounded because it has lots of eyes and lots of perspectives. And the OS vendors that kind of build their own stuff their own APIs, I think, are losing an opportunity to tap into you know, the winning energy of a bunch of skilled people that really want to help and add value to their platform. So, you know, if there are any OS members in the room, you know, listen to your hardware vendors, they're just trying to help. <laughs> I think there's another aspect to it also, and that is one of the biggest fears of operators is becoming uh, losing control of the services that they're selling. Operators up to now, they've been making a lot of money selling various types of services. They sell data traffic, they say, sell number of calls or call minutes, opening a call, uh, sending text messages, and so forth. And they like to sell these as bundles. One of the things that's happening with application market and with IP telephony and things like that is that uh, operators are starting to lose some of that control of the market, and it's becoming more of a, an application driven market and it's going to be interesting to see how the operators handle that. I don't have an answer here for what's going to happen but it, specifically going forward for 4G LTE for instance when everything is data in uh, binary data in one form or another, how are the operators going to handle uh, shipping the data package and, and also as people travel the world more, how are they going to uh, handle the data the cost of transferring data between the user and their home base. Today, for instance, if you travel abroad, when I travel to the States from Sweden, data traffic is $20 a megabyte. The first thing that happens is I turn off my data roaming, so I don't really want to pay that much. And I think that's going to affect it as well. Yeah, I think that I think that's a, a great segue to the next topic, is because um, there are these barriers that we've had to deal with when traveling, and, and more and more of us are traveling, and, um, and and also there are more options, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, in home we're at Wi-Fi, then we're moving around and, and we're using various uh, wireless technologies, and, um, and the carriers, of course, have benefited from the, the situation in these uh, islands, but... Um, do they, does this change, do they go away, or in, do the operators have the power to maybe, pr you know, uh, protect their systems so far, or are they going to, to lose the ability to protect their little fiefdoms? It is, uh, it is an arms race, and there are, of course, many uh, weapons they haven't used yet. They can do quality of service uh, kinds of things that would make it very difficult to build a good IP from that top of the data networks. On the other hand, the more games they play, the more they risk losing their customers. I do think the game is sort of over for the carriers. I think they are in the bulk data business now, and some of them may not realize it, but basically they are not service providers uh, anymore. Uh, that role has moved on. Um, I do remember with pleasure an early Kronos panel, just like this, which Kathleen moderated, yeah. and she asked what was needed to have a a viable game market on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone on the panel said the carriers have to buy. Yeah. And, <laughs> and lo and behold. It uh, is coming. 
It, it, uh, well, this was extreme language, of course, and he didn't mean die, but you know, they have to know what business they're in. And they're in the business of bandwidth, they're not in the business of services. Uh, so, as far as the carriers, I think that situation is taking care of itself. We are going to have the same problem now with the platform providers, that they need to know what business they're in. They're in the business of enabling applications. And to the extent that they have another vision, I think they're going to be hurt and disappear. I would agree with Tom. I think the, the carriers are, I've lost. Every time a carrier installs something on my phone, I go, oh no, I don't want to get it off as fast as I can. That's not adding value. Um, but bandwidth is value. I think once they do internalize the business they're in, they'll, re they'll realize that business is fundamental to the mobile industry. And people are going to be willing to pay for good bandwidth wherever they go without all these tricks and roaming things. Mm -hmm. There's The world's going to be connected. That is a great business to be in if they just figure out how to really. So in other words, do you think that the, there's a the potential for the, there to be like a baseline so that we're not paying these like huge, horrible roaming fees and that sort of thing, that uh, that's more open. And yet, if you want better bandwidth and you pay for better bandwidth or you, you want to get your movies, then you turn it on or off or something like that. Yeah, I would incur, if I were an operator, if I was an operator, I would be looking to add value to the customer. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if they can, I mean, we need the operators and their investment in the networks is something that no one else can really do. So they're a vital part of the ecosystem. And people are willing to pay for them. And if they were to, to enable more data, data usage you know, in scale with their costs so they can make money, um, the world's going to consume a million times more data than it does today. That's got to be an opportunity if they just figure it out. Mm -hmm. So that um, brings us to one of the, it's all, you know, for a lot of people, it has to be about how do I protect my, my income. And, uh, and Neil, you were just saying, was it you? <laughs> it said the uh, the hardware it, now it's up to the platform providers, the hardware uh, providers to to recognize what business they're in. As well, you know now uh, now that the carriers are, are becoming uh, service providers and maybe that's all. So, um, but then but then when all things are equal that way, it becomes very hard to differentiate and to make money over everybody else. And, and uh, right now, just I mean we've got plenty of runway, I think. But um, especially with ultrabook books and tablets coming out and Windows on ARM and all this stuff happening, I think there's, there's going to be plenty of opportunity. But uh, but there's also plenty of danger. For well, so I said the the uh, platform owners need to know that they are in the business of enabling apps to reach uh, customers. But there is great value they can add. Uh, sadly, uh, in terms of quality control in terms of protecting people from hostile applications. Uh, and obviously, Apple has shown that design matters and uh, elegance matters. Uh, making the process easy matters. So there is still room for them to differentiate. Uh, but it's not in delivering apps themselves. That's not their job. Yeah, I, it's like 3D, like people keep saying, Soon we're not going to need a faster GPU. And it's like, what? what? We just started, we're 20, 30 years into this 3D Odyssey thing. We've just started, you know, until we can truly create reality on our screen, that you cannot tell the difference between that and a window outside. And there's so much more of the innovation. I think the mobile industry is in that same state, even it's even younger. We've just started to figure out what these mobile devices are going to be what shape they are, their connectivity, how people use them, how people integrate them deeper and deeper into their personal lives. It's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for differentiation. It's, it's just, again, I think it comes down to customer value. If people are really focused on customer value, adding um, and value and delighting users, there's so much opportunity. But just companies, I think, just cost reduce, they're the ones that get squeezed out the bottom sooner than the others. I would agree with that. There's so many things that are happening with the, the mobile market, with new technologies, 
actually being able to enter the mobile market. We're seeing for the first time the battery life and the processing power being able to run the kind of applications that users really want in their mobile devices. Things that make your life easier. Uh, beyond having just a calendar function and a contacts, now you can find out where you are and what's uh, around you and what things that you are looking at, what they actually are. Now, of course, I'm also talking a little bit about augmented reality, but there's also uh, other functionality. Uh, keeping connected with friends and um, finding out where other people are located around you, getting notifications that, that somebody you know is around the corner and so forth. And these things are, are uh, as hardware manufacturers, are going to be enabling these kinds of applications, uh, introducing more and more sensors into the hardware. That's where they're going to differentiate themselves in the market. Excuse me. Well, I'm going to show you a little bit of the content of the content. I want to give you a little bit of my personal perspective and thoughts. I hope you can hear me in the audience. I hope you can hear me in the audience. I hope you can hear me in the audience. I'm going to talk about the last few words. 呃，就是说，呃，然后我评价主要是想想对中国这个市场给大家一些做一些评价，希望给给给你们一些给你们一些 input。呃，这里面涉及到刚才的话题，涉及到运营商，这我稍微提一下，刚才那个翻译不对，那个翻译说的是操作者，实际上是运营商的意思啊，就是运营商，还有呃软件开发商。呃，还有这个手机的操作平台，还有应用开发，就是说这个钱应该是怎么赚？市场上应该是什么问问题？我我只是加一些我个人的评价、呃。在我的理解，现在中国的市场上，呃，如果说我们把把这个生意的模式用两个大的阵营来看，呃，现在挣钱的，就是说成功的商业模式可以看看到两个大阵营，第一个是运营商。加 iPhone 非常简单，中国有三个大运营商：中国移动、中国联通、中国电信。现在已经变成一个趋势了，就是说谁能够绑定 iPhone， 谁就能赚钱。所以说，刚才各个专家的呃观点，在我看来都都都不是很能够完全体现在中国的这个形式。现在很明显，就是说 iPhone 的这个封闭的政策，最少在中国看来是非常成功。我相信，呃 ，iPhone 在这个世界上赚的最多的钱是从中国人民手上赚的。虽然说他们的这个工厂并不是很体面啊，据说有些这方面的这个这个 scandal。但是很明显，就是他们的商业模式现在非常成功，而且从我的观察来说，应该说中国的运营商现在最喜欢的就是 iPhone。呃，中国的运营商包括中国移动在内，曾经尝试过不同的方式，比方说。开发自己的操作系统，而这些操作系统呢，大多数其实也是基于安卓的开发的 ，ARM 开发，但是目前看来没有一家成功了。现在很明显，运营商非常追捧一种模式，就是说跟 iPhone 签订，呃，签订一个一个一个一个更好合同，什么时候能把 iPhone 引引进来？现在大家 iPhone 三完了以后，现在大家又在争 iPhone 五，我看运营商的热情比我们都高得多。所以说，很明显，这是我讲的第一个观察的现象，就是说，在目前中国的，从运营商，呃，成功的商业模式就是绑定 iPhone， 或者说绑定 Apple。所以从这个角度上，我我认为 Apple 是做的非常成功，它的这个封闭体系，所以说所有的问题，硬件的价格，软件，呃，这个 App Store， 基本上现在全是 Apple 一家说了算。然后另外一个观察。就是说，呃，在在安卓的这个阵营上，呃，我觉得比较明显的一个特点，可以从平板电脑，就是 tablet 这个这个发展来看，还有现在在中国的所谓的中低价位的智能手机，因为现在很大一个趋势就是说，在中国，呃，主要的手机制造商在主推价格在。一千人民币左右的智能手机，呃，目标就是说这个智能手机应该具有
现在 iPhone 具有的所有的硬件软件的特性，然后足够让大家做智能手机应该做的事情，然后价位在中国的老百姓基本上，应该说在中产阶级都可以可以付得起的这个水平。那很明显，只有一个趋势，就是都是在用安卓平台。呃，另外可以看出比较成功的一个一个趋势，就是在平板电脑上。呃，安卓的操作系统已经占了很大的一个市场。呃，应该说，如果说抛去 iPad 的影响，可以看出安安卓的这个操作系统在平板电脑在至少在中国的成长，这个趋势非常强劲。这里面有一些我个人的观察，就是说，在中国 ，Internet 的凡是涉足 Internet 的软件提供商。他们的赚钱模式现在基本上是个不变的方式，就是说，提供一个主要的服务，希望面对的是所有的终端用户，而这个主要的服务对所有的终端用户来说都是免费的，这一点已经是屡试不爽。就是比方说我们大家都知道的，即时通信，这个腾讯 IM 的这个这个主要的。就是提供的软件叫 QQ， 它其实就是，呃，跟最早以前这个 ICQ 是一个东西，呃，然后它提供所有 Skype 提供的所有的功能，然后现在包括微博，就是国外的 Twitter， 包括其他的很多这样的服务，基本上同样一个特点，包括中国最近做的很成功的这个杀毒软件三六零，呃。成功的模式都是一样的，就是说它主要提供的服务，对终终端用户来说是免费的。然后它赚钱的方式是从这个主要服务之后的衍生服务，尤其是一些特定的，比方说企业用户，呃，一些一些特定的行业应用，从这方从这方面赚钱。所以说，如果我们把这个这个看成两大阵营，一个是 Internet 阵营，一个是。一个是这个运营商主导的传统的电信的阵营啊，这个模式看得非常清楚，就是说，电信呃电信传统的电信 ，telecommunication 这边，现在至少从运营商追捧的还是一个封闭的体系，而从 Internet 追追追捧的是一种开放的体系，然后呢，在这个追捧的开放的体系里面，大家都在拼命压硬件，就是说大家都知道从硬件上是赚不了钱的。所以说，这个这个手机的价钱做的越来越低，呃，我不知道你们有没有了解，最近在中国出的一个小米手机，我想大家都知道，就是说价格从价格已经做到，就是说，传统的手机市场商认为这是不可能的一个价格，就是一个所谓的自杀价格，就是说这个价钱在硬件上已经不可能挣钱了，但是它为什么能做？我相信它还是在挣钱，就是说。也许他在硬件上，呃，也许我们所有的人都是被硬件提供商欺骗的。这个就是这里面还有一个利润空间，我们都不知道。呃，他们给所有的世界上的人说，都是说这个这个这个硬件做不出来。比方说诺基亚人也说做不出来，苹果的人也说做不出来，但是我不知道为什么他们能做得出来。呃，或者呢，就是说他期望在后面衍生的服务中间，仍然有他有他赚钱的方式。我就稍微提这么两点吧，希望能够做一个影子。大家都比较感兴趣，希望大家很难得利用这个机会，跟那个 c h r o m e s 的专家做一个交流。希望你们也也也提一些问题，做一些。个人意见仅供参考，谢谢。Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very、uh, educational for me. I didn't know about the situation with iPhone and carriers today in China. I think uh, uh, it's Always unhealthy when one platform is too has too much power. So I don't think it will continue that iPhone will have so much power.、Um, you say that there is a healthy market for more internet devices, tablets,、uh, with a more balanced kind of uh, uh, economic system. And I hope I would expect that as people become comfortable with the internet tablet. Which is not iOS based, 
then they will be more comfortable with the phone, which is not iOS based. And maybe the market will sort itself out a little bit. But it's very interesting to hear uh, the way things are going for them. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the it's not just unhealthy, it sounds like a real opportunity. If there's one company that is uh, so dumb, then I, I agree with the comment that iPhone is obviously strong here in China. Uh, that's a real opportunity for either the Android community or some other OS. Android seems like easily the best at, to actually figure out how to put a stop mm -hmm. to that and start, start making their own business. And I, I, I agree with the comment too that the funding, the money channels, it kind of comes back to what we were saying right at the beginning, the money flow is no longer obvious so much as it was in previous markets. There's weird money flows. I mean, in the States, you know, you, they often will give uh, phones away for less than cost, not just the suicide price, you know, the underwater price, uh, because you know, the, the people get uh, revenues in other ways. I think there's another aspect to this also to think about, and that's the uh, timing to market. If you uh, compare iPhone and Android, that uh, Android has, it's been keeping very close to the heels of uh, iOS. Uh, every now and then it may pass it, but uh, iOS still seems to keep a little bit ahead. If you're then taking the latest version of Android, and you're creating a new version of Android, or a new operating system that is based on Android. You have the lag time of coming to market and competing with a newer version of the operating system. The, the feature and the functionality of the operating systems is an extremely volatile market. The lifespan of an, any one given version of an operating system is so short that if you're putting in two development cycles, that I really don't see any way to keep up with that. And so it's not surprising that uh, a, um, a second generation, so to speak, uh, the second development generation operating system has a hard time competing with iOS. I, I think uh, economics is wonderful. Uh, uh, it's like evolution, it takes care of problems. So if there's a problem today, I think the market adapts. And one example which I'll give in my own company, we used to deliver our graphics drivers first on Linux platforms because it was very easy. All our customers understood it. Everything was, uh, uh, and all the software was transparent. Now we deliver on Android first because more of our customers want that. So we are taking steps to reduce the time to market for our Android customers for our GPUs. I am quite sure that other vendors are doing the same. Uh, I think if there is demand and there is opportunity, as Neil said, people will go to the opportunity. So it may still be difficult, it will not be easy, but, but it will improve. I have one question, Barry. What did you mean when uh, you said iOS keeps ahead? Usability. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, I agree with usability. I think that can be a gap, I suppose. Uh, but but the, just in terms of the shipment volume, to speak to kind of the current situation in China, I mean, the same thing happened in the US, and Kathy, you, you had the figures more than I did. The, the, the um, iPhone had a very strong early lead, but when the, kind of the blocks were taken away from the Android side, Android just took it, took it over. I mean, that, that graph right there, that's, that's the, is that US or that world, is that worldwide? It's worldwide. That's worldwide, right, right. So that kind of shows what can change very quickly. Right. I would like to ask a question uh, to know uh, the uh, elasticity of pricing to the selection of uh, mobile homes that you would buy. Uh, I heard um, the similar, I mean, the mobile handset with similar features to uh, um, iPhone is available at 1,000 RMB here in China, right? I heard so. And uh, uh, the average selling price of iPhone 4S, iPhone 4, will be 5,000 RMB, correct? Which would you think, which would you think people would choose with that price difference? 
。我认为在中国人购买智能手机的时候，价钱并不是第一个最主要的考虑的因素。呃，其实，在中国。在买 iPhone 或者说安卓的手机，大多数是取决于这个消费者是否追求时尚的一种心理。所以很多人，简单的说吧，追求时尚的人，他会花五倍的价钱去买 iPhone。我相信这是 iPhone 成功的地方。也许更多的工薪阶层 （working class） 他们会买一千块钱的安卓智能手机。所以，我刚才漏说一点，也就是说，在中国实际上，对手机软件，呃，软件生产商来说，大家更追捧的是 iOS， 而不是安卓的，因为很明显，在中国现在安给安卓的企业软件根本就不挣钱。但是我刚刚说了，在 Internet 的阵营里面，有一些有一些巨头一直在推这件事一直在推这个安卓上的 application。因为他们也不是希望通过这个这一款软件挣钱。比方说，现在有一个有有一个比较明显的，这是我我个人的观察，就是说现在，呃，中国正正在逐渐开放手机支付。手机支付本身就是一个，呃，以前是跟银行非常紧密关联的一项业务，很少，就是现在刚刚打开这个壁垒，就是说手机上也可以做支付。虽然在很多别的地方都实现了，在中在中国这个还是逐渐的一个过程。所以说，对于对于像像我们这样小的软件生产商来说，对我们来说，做这个软件是根本不可能挣钱。但是对比较大的这个 Internet provider， 他们就愿意做，因为他们看重的是使用的群众的这个数量。当使用人群的数量足够大的时候，这个 revenue 就是。他早晚要来，我也不懂他应该是怎么办，但是你懂我的意思，就是说，在中国 ，Internet 的应用主要是靠用户的基数，只要用户的基数大，这个商业模式才才逐渐的看清。很多事情我们现在也看不清，但是，这就是我我我说为什么，安卓的这个这这条路，可以看出来也好像也是很有很有出路。但是 iOS 看着也非常强劲，这是我的观察。Thank you. This is again very interesting. One thing we know, of course, everywhere in the world, it is the case that uh, uh, the sheep lifestyle changes quickly.、And、so when I、uh, am in the U.S. and I、uh, show my iPhone, some young person will say, "Oh, you are an old guy. You have an iPhone." <laughs> and the young people all have Android. Uh, and this has changed very quickly recently, and it could change the other way again tomorrow,、uh, because in the U.S., a good Android phone, good iPhone is about the same price.、Uh, I think for the for Apple and the and the Android handset makers, it's always a struggle to be who can be the the cool, chic provider. But I do think if, as you say, mostly the The price difference for iPhone is driven by what is cool. I think tomorrow it could be completely different,、uh, and that probably will improve things a lot for the small software developer when they have uh, uh, more choice about where they can deliver. Perhaps speaking to that point, I mean, in the U.S., there are some very interesting ads now. Sound is actually a Samsung ad, and、um, some previous Android. Adverts for tablets and devices, in my opinion, in two tech, they're talking gigahertz and stuff, and no one understands that stuff. The,、um, the the latest round from Samsung have been lifestyle ads and attacking specifically attacking Apple, as specifically attacking the people that carry that their, their proposition in their ad is people that carry an iPhone and queue up to buy an iPhone at the iPhone at the Apple store. They're not fashionable. They're just being followers, right? And so it's very interesting. I mean, the, the smart Android phone manufacturers have realised this is a lifestyle battle. It's not a tech battle in the end. Okay, so、uh, I think we'll move on. But it,、uh, pull us back if you want to go back.、Um, Uh, you mentioned, and I think I think this sort of、uh, introduces that idea of the、uh, Internet of Things, and 
and we're going uh, we're going to be using our funds for talking to machines and that sort of thing and that uh, paying for um, things which is so interesting and another revenue opportunity that uh, is going to become huge obviously but also the things talk to each other and um, and I was wondering I actually was sort of curious what uh, the Kronos folks are uh, talking about along these lines. Um, and there's also, I think, uh, augmented reality probably gets in here a little bit as well. But, um, so tell me what's going on there. I would summarize it that is out of Kronos' scope to do, um, no, 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 to do some things <laughs> like, um, the, the, the wireless protocols for wireless payment and stuff like that, RF, RFD, RFI and stuff, it's not currently covered across the scope. But the vision side is very much in across the scope, and that's going to be yeah. one part of this mix, is pointing your phone at stuff, not even necessarily doing augmented reality, but recognizing stuff, tracking stuff in the real world, being able to be aware of your visual and oral um, um, environment is going to be an important part of the, that mix, and that's something we're definitely working on. It's true. Kronos would not typically, in the past, work with a standard, for example, uh, security. So if my if my phone is my terminal to communicate with the universe of things, things like the protocol from the phone to the things, mm -hmm. or how do you trust, how do you know which things you can trust, uh, would typically not be Kronos. Kronos usually deals with APIs for applications to connect to something. So if there is a network here which is aware of the other devices in the room, knows where they are, what services they provide, uh, that needs to be exposed to the application somehow in a way that is reasonable for the small software developer who wants to uh, use this capability. That would be uh, a typical Kronos application. The, the Internet of Things scares me. I am an old man. Uh, it's a very different future from the present. I know that it's coming, but I have great trouble visioning how it's going to work. I, I read three days ago, my own company uh, introduced the M0 Plus microprocessor, which fits in a hundredth of a square millimeter of silicon. We can't make chips that small. Uh, and burns nine microamps of power active. So you can take it to a battery and it will last as long as the battery, and when the battery is gone, it's gone. I don't know what that world is like. Uh, I, I'm very interested to see. I think one of the things here too is that needs to be thought of when you talk about the Internet of Things is data integrity. Uh, as Tom mentioned, ensuring that you know that the data that you're treating or that you're receiving is actually coming from a trusted source and from that specific source. <coughs> when we look at the Kronos APIs such as StreamIn but, and uh, uh, OpenBL, we're going to get into those questions. I think it's unavoidable. It is not something that Kronos really has a lot of experience doing, although we have member companies who work with that in other organizations. But at some point, we are going to have to look at those aspects of it and to, um, to ensure that when we communicate with devices on our own system that may not have been there from the beginning, to know that it is a trusted device. Or if you're doing virtualization of devices, that you believe that the device is on that system that is in reality located somewhere else. What, what problems arise with data integrity and security? That's definitely something that we're going to have to discuss, even though it may not be represented in the Kronos API directly, it's certainly going to affect them. Uh, I have a theoretical problem about the Kronos API and the Kronos ecosystem. Uh, we know that MIT professor David Clark wrote a theory called the Apro Apocalypse of Two Elements. It talks about the relations between research, standardization, and uh, investment. It say when with the advent of the new technology such as the graphic library or etc. 
there's lots of people doing research. There is a peak, and there is a gap between a lot of investments was put into the field. And what do you think? Uh, the Kronos ecosystem. Its current trend is just in the gap. It's earlier or later. That's my question. Um, to address that specific question, I would say that when we look at research that's going on in these different areas, and um, with research, I want to lump in innovation that's uh, with various companies that are doing new technologies and such. A an API that is designed to uh, adapt and to allow innovation in the underlying parts um, that still allows for a long-term communications between an application and the underlying system really allows that uh, allows innovation and investment in innovation to take place. Uh, an example of that is um, uh, the graphics library. I, I have a new way of communicating between a GPU and a screen that doesn't specifically affect the API for the software. You can still take advantage of that functionality. An API that would say that I have to use a specific code or I have to use a specific method for doing something, the underlying implementation, uh, really limits innovation. And that's one of the problems with the multimedia frameworks, for instance, is that the multimedia framework is defined by the code itself, whereas an API allows you to implement it in any any way that you choose, so that you can incorporate new uh, new um, innovations, new ideas, and still have the same communications with the application. And, and I think the other way to, to answer that question, I think the so that's any standards body, not just Chronos, has to be very careful at which stage they come in. I think pure research by committee is a very bad idea. The, in fact, design by committee can be a bad idea too. I think successful standards occur when A, everyone has accepted that, that there's a real need and we're not debating whether something is needed or not. Everyone's committed to finding a solution. Doesn't Whatever it is, there's a point of solution. And B, there are already proven proprietary solutions out there, so we know it's possible. And the standardization process is primarily agreeing amongst the industry what's the best way to deliver this functionality. And yes, innovate along the way, sure, but, but not do fundamental research in, in committee. It, that's too early for a standardization process. So when Kronos considers whether to start a new working group, often this is exactly the discussion we have. We just had it for uh, the uh, computer vision uh, APIs. The question everyone was asking was, is this technology ready to be standardized or is it too soon? And uh, it was a long discussion before we decided, yes, we can, we can have a standard which will not do harm. Uh, but I agree, it is, a, it is a risk. We do try, as I explained in my talk, to have uh, uh, not to specify too much, but to leave room for improvements and growth. Uh, but it, it's always something to discuss. An example where we had that discussion and we decided it was too, too early to start was the ray tracing discussion. You know, several companies have suggested that we need a ray tracing standard. But the discussion in, in amongst the Kronos members was, we don't really know how that is going to really be shipped in the industry. But that's an interesting research project, but it's really too soon. So we, we don't jump on everything that comes through the door. We, we do try to make the right decisions. OK, well, I think that wraps it up. And uh, I think it was a really good day. Thank you all for uh, helping us at debut. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for coming today. And I actually would like also like to, to thank the speakers tra traveled a long way and given a lot of time uh, this week. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for speaking uh, this week. So we have, we have two little prizes and two more interesting prizes.
So we have two Kronos USB sticks. Are they packed with all the presentations? <laughs> <laughs> and we have two iPod Nanos. Um, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to ask a question, hopefully not too tricky, and the first person to put their hand up with the right answer will be the lucky winner. So let's start with one of the USB sticks. All right. So, okay. What is the latest released version of OpenGL? Yeah, yes. Correct. Congratulations. Okay. One more USB stick, and then we'll get on to the iPods. What month was WebGL 1.0 released? Me? Yes. WebGL 1.0. It was last year. Yes, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> he said it. All right. Don't shout out though. That's that's cheating. He, here you go. <laughs> you cheated really first. <laughs> <laughs> cheated first, so you got away with it. Okay. How many APIs is Kronos currently supporting? 15. 15, correct. Congratulations. <laughs> Last one. What is the name of the new Vision Acceleration API? <laughs> correct. <laughs> no, he's not Kronos member. I'm not the man. Again, thank you everyone for coming. I hope you had a great day. If you want to give us any feedback on the day, uh, we'd love to hear it. Um, but thank you again for coming. Thank you.